Ladies and gentlemen, firemen and people of the book, welcome one and all to iWizard. Today, we're going to be talking about the dystopian novel Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Let's get into it. It was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and changed. With the brass nozzle in his fists, with this great python spitting its venomous kerosene upon the world, the blood pounded in his head, and his hands were the hands of some amazing conductor, playing all the symphonies of blazing and burning to bring down the tatters and charcoal ruins of history. With his symbolic helmet numbered 451 on his stolid head, and his eyes all orange flame with the thought of what came next, he flicked the igniter, and the hose jumped up in a gorging fire that burned the evening sky red and yellow and black. He strode in a swarm of fireflies. The mechanical hound slept but did not sleep, lived but did not live in its gently humming, gently vibrating, softly illuminated kennel back in a dark corner of the firehouse. The moonlight from the open sky framed through the great window touched here and there on the brass and copper and the steel of the faintly trembling beast. Light flickered on its bits of ruby glass and on the sensitive capillary hairs and the nylon brushed nostrils of the creature that quivered gently, gently, its eight legs spidered under it on rubber padded paws. If you don't want a man unhappy politically, don't give him two sides of a question to worry him. Give one. Better yet, give him none. Let him forget there's such a thing as war. If the government is inefficient, top-heavy, and tax-mad, better it be all those than that people worry over it. All right, Jordan here. So welcome back and full disclosure, this review might be a little bit biased because this is one of my favorite novels and it's certainly my favorite dystopian novel still uh, to this day. And I've read many dystopian novels, uh, 1984, uh, Brave New World, Anthem, many others. And this is still my favorite one of all time. And it is the first dystopian novel I ever read. I guess unless you count Lois Lowry's The Giver, which I had to read in seventh grade for school. So let's start out, as always, with a little bit of background for Fahrenheit 451. The book was published in 1953. This is Ray Bradbury's second published book after The Martian Chronicles. It is what I would call soft science fiction as opposed to hard science fiction. Uh, this book is very character-based. It asks these deep political and sociological and philosophical questions. Um, the title, uh, it is well known that the title uh, comes from the auto-ignition point of paper there. So that's a very clever way of telling uh, readers that this book is going to be about the burning and censorship of literature. Okay, and so why don't we start out with what the book is about. Here is a little summary I put together. Set in an unspecified city, likely in the American Midwest, in the near dystopian future, Fahrenheit 451 tells the story of Guy Montag, a fireman whose job is not to put out fires, but to start them. As a fireman, Montag's job is to burn outlawed books, along with the houses they're hidden in. Montag never questions the destruction and ruin his actions produce, returning home after work each day to his dull, domestic life, and to his wife Mildred, who spends all day zoned out, lazing around the house with her television family, her unthinking bourgeois friends, and her seashell earphones as she loses herself nightly in transitory pleasures and mind-numbing drugs. Like everyone else, Guy goes along with this, reluctant to think his own thoughts, afraid to question the world around him. But when he meets an eccentric young neighbor, Clarice, who introduces him to a past where people didn't live in fear, and to a present where one sees the world through the ideas in books instead of the mindless chatter of television, Montag begins to question everything he has ever known. With the help of a rogue professor, Montag learns the beauty of great books and realizes that his is a civilization worth preserving. And he is not alone. All right, so that is a kind of 
uh, back of the book style summary there. Let's get into what I liked and what I didn't so much like about the book. Here we go. What I liked. Can we just start with the very beginning of the book and say that I think these are some of the best opening lines uh, of any book ever. It was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and changed, with the brass nozzle in his fists, with this great python spitting its venomous kerosene upon the world, the blood pounded in his head, and his hands were the hands of some amazing conductor, playing all the symphonies of blazing and burning to bring down the tatters and charcoal ruins of history. So those are just, you know, could anyone do that better, right? That is just... Um, peak Ray Bradbury there, um, totally idiosyncratic, beautiful uh, prose. Um, those opening lines could only have been written by Ray Bradbury, a total genius. And I'll just say that the prose throughout this book is just beautiful, lyrical, um, evocative, poetic. It's one of those books, um, I guess, as bad as the society is here, you just want it to go on forever. You want to keep following these characters and you want to see Montag rebuild his civilization. Speaking of, let's talk about that society. Apparently, Bradbury meant to set the society in Fahrenheit um, in 2049 or something like that, but the story is written like it's set in the far distant future. And so what we have here, like pretty much all dystopian novels, is an oppressive government and a sick society. In this future America, people lack freedom of thought. Everything's been dumbed down. People's minds have been slowly melted. Their critical thinking faculties are totally eroded. And there just doesn't seem to be any hope. People walk around um, numbed out and anesthetized. They live these fast lives of fleeting sensual pleasure. They take drugs. I don't think Bradbury gives the drugs a name, uh, but they're basically like his equivalent of Soma. So the people live these sad, atomized, insular lives. They have their earphones in all the time. They drug themselves to sleep every night. They don't go outside. They don't even know what grass or flowers look like because the only time they ever see these things is when they're speeding around on the highway. And even then, they only see grass and flowers as colorful little blurs as they drive by. In fact, the people in this society drive so fast all the time that the government has decided to lengthen the billboards on the highway so that they're like 100 feet long. Otherwise, people can't see them. So just think about that for a minute. Instead of posting speed limits right on the highway that say you have to drive 65, 75 miles an hour, they solve the problem by lengthening the billboards. Instead of correcting the debasement of society, the people in charge just adjust to it, right? In fact, the people will actually arrest you, the, the police will arrest you if you drive too slow. And I think this whole metaphor actually goes a long way here in explaining the rest of society. Um, what you have here in this society is a populace that never slows down, never stops to think, nobody sits in their own silence, nobody goes for walks or hikes, and that's pretty much how the government likes it. They want people who are physical rather than cerebral. They want people who are kind of unself-aware, who don't think about the corruption going on in society, who don't question the rules or how society got that way. And so that obviously makes the people easier to govern. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, the main character of this book is Montag, and he is basically just going along to get along. Um, when one day he meets uh, Clarice, uh, the neighbor girl, and she asks him a simple question. Didn't the firemen once put out fires instead of starting them? How did things get this way, where firemen are actually torching books and burning people's houses down instead of saving people? And so Montag starts to wonder, and this leads him to his kind of revolution in thought. So early on in the book, we learn that the job of firemen started around the time of the Civil War. And don't worry that I'm spoiling anything because I believe you actually learn this on page like 30 or 35 or something like that. So if you're wondering how this society became a dystopia, how everything becomes so dumbed down, what happened is around the time of the Civil War, people didn't get along very well. Back then, people actually thought about things, they read books, they had different ideas. But Bradbury tells us that as the world becomes more and more populated, as we had to worry about more and more people, 
the consequences of letting everyone have their own unique ideas became too dire. Um, to add to this, the rise in literacy across the world also meant that things like newspapers and books and magazines had to be leveled down to what Bradbury calls a sort of paste pudding norm. Um, so with the increase in the amount of published materials, there came this pressure for books to be more like one another and easier to read, right? Mass consumption. They started coming out with these Reader's Digest editions of books, these condensed books for people to read. Um, and so once photography, film, and television hits the scene, this makes it even easier to present information for the masses in a way that is quickly digestible and very visual. And so the explosion of these mediums over time made the slower, more reflective process of sitting down uh, and reading a book, right, um, less popular, right? People stop wanting to read books. And over time, books start to become shortened and illustrated on every other page so that people could read them and keep up with their neighbors. Um, classics like War and Peace were reduced to little columns in digests. Same with politics. Political news uh, had to become shortened as well. Um, and, and Bradbury even mentions first uh, uh, political news will be shortened down to the level of one tiny little column in the newspaper, then to the length of two sentences. And then eventually people just start reading the headlines, right? And sharing headlines and pretending like they actually know what's going on. Does any of this sound familiar, right? People just seeing headlines and then like retweeting uh, those articles that they've never even read. And so society here basically becomes an instant gratification culture. Academic study in school is shortened. The curriculum is dumbed down. Philosophy, history, foreign languages, grammar, all of that stuff is just dropped from school. We don't need it anymore. Job training basically becomes a matter of just people learning how to press buttons and pull switches. Discipline is relaxed over time and people start to labor solely for after work pleasures, right? Working for the weekends. And rather than thinking for themselves, the children are all basically in this society encouraged to just become good at sports and other sort of mindless groupish activities. People are encouraged to seek out um, titillating whiz-bang pleasures and fleeting transitory experiences. And as the fire chief uh, Beatty actually puts it, Beatty is actually the bad guy, people's minds drink less and less. Ain't that the truth? And so what is happening here to return to our billboard metaphor is that instead of trying to fix the problems in society, instead of saying, look, our attention spans are waning, maybe we need to slow down and fix that, we need to start to think again, we need to develop our minds so that we can see the smaller billboards uh, once again, instead of doing that, the society here just lengthens the billboard, right? Just kicks the can down the road. And you can see this in our culture too. Books have declined in quality in our own culture. People are losing an interest in the classics. Television shows are becoming more vapid. I mean, not to sound like a grumpy old man, uh, but to sound a little bit like a grumpy old man. When I was growing up, I watched Bugs Bunny and Rugrats and Doug Funny and TV Land. And then when I got older and my parents had two more children, my little brothers, um, I was actually much older than them. So I would see the cartoons that they watched and it was just totally different, I started to notice. I had no clue what was going on when I would watch their TV shows, the cartoons these kids watch today are just kind of bonkers. The characters talk a mile a minute. They're constantly snorting things and going crazy. The colors are way brighter and flashier than they were when I was a kid. A million things are happening all at once. Seriously, just turn on like Comedy Central or Cartoon Network. Things are constantly jumping out at you. It's like an MC Escher uh, sketch or some Rene Magritte painting. Nothing makes sense. Everything's just totally absurdist. I think whoever is making these kids shows today are on like Ritalin or something, uh, I, I imagine. Um, even if you just 
watch the news today. Issues are being shoved into these five minute little segments where six so-called experts have to deliver their sort of talking points in these little sound bites with these silly bumper sticker slogans, platitudes. Um, people don't really subscribe to newspapers anymore, especially young people. They just kind of go on social media, read headlines and retweet articles that they've never read. And in fact, if you do actually sit down and read the news, these outlets are pretty much just um, when they're not doing clickbait, they're pretty much just echo chambers, right? That never really consider the other perspective. And so one of the things, this is kind of a long way of saying that one of the things I really like about Fahrenheit is that it's not just this dystopia where some Hitlerian or Stalin-esque tyrant rises up and takes away everyone's liberties and everything is just cast into shadow and darkness. It's the people who cause all of this. It's the decadence of the society. Um, the people themselves sort of consent to their own tyranny. They no longer have a stomach for freedom. They are no longer capable of governing themselves. They have failed to cultivate those qualities of judgment, taste, civic virtue, right, and participation, what, what um, Cicero calls humanitas. Those are the qualities and habits of mind that sustain freedom, that enable people to exercise liberty and govern themselves. And what happens in this book is that people decide that they're no longer going to zealously guard their liberties. And that is how society slips into tyranny and darkness. Another reason that books have been banned is that quite simply, people are offended by them and books cause strife right? I'm going to quote Beatty here again, who, by the way, Beatty essentially ends up being the villain in this story. And let me just say what an excellent villain Beatty is, by the way. I'll just pause for a second and say that what's interesting about Beatty is that he's this kind of self-aware bad guy who actually reads books. And though his position is that books have to be done away with, pretty much everything that comes out of Beatty's mouth is like some beautiful quote from Shakespeare or Dante or Plato. And so he's a little bit like Iago from Othello, but he's also, I guess, a little bit like um, O'Brien from 1984 or even Ellsworth Toohey from Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead. Beatty's this kind of really tortured bad guy figure. He's this guy who operates in a system in which he's a lover of literature, you can tell, and yet he believes that they prevent people from being happy. He, he knows the real truth. He knows the history of censorship and book burning, and he kind of knows the secrets behind the society, and yet he's still kind of um, upholding the system. And so I wanted to read you a quote from Beatty where he's basically talking about the way in which none of this really comes from the top down, that it's organic, the oppression. We essentially did this to ourselves. We couldn't handle our own freedom. He tells Montag, the bigger the population, the more minorities. Don't step on the toes of the dog lovers, the cat lovers, doctors, lawyers, merchants, chiefs, Mormons, Baptists, Unitarians, second generation Chinese, Swedes, Italians, Germans, Texans, Brooklynites, Irishmen, people from Oregon or Mexico. The people in this book, this play, this TV serial are not meant to represent any actual painters, cartographers, mechanics, anywhere. The bigger your market, Montag, the less you handle controversy. Remember that. All the minor, minor minorities with their navels to be kept clean. Authors full of evil thoughts, lock up your typewriters. They did. Magazines became a nice blend of vanilla tapioca. The public, knowing what it wanted, let the comic books survive. And the three-dimensional sex magazines, of course. And there you have it, Montag. It didn't come from the government down. There was no dictum, no declaration, no censorship. Not to start with, no. Technology, mass exploitation, and minority pressure carried the trick. Thank God. Colored people don't like little black Sambo? Burn it. White people don't feel good about Uncle Tom's cabin? Burn it. Someone's written a book on tobacco and cancer of the lungs. The cigarette people are weeping? Burn the book. Serenity, Montag. Peace, Montag. We must all be alike. Not everyone born free and equal, as the Constitution says, but everyone made equal. Each man the image of every other. Then all are happy, for there are no mountains to make them cower, to judge themselves against. Plus, Beatty adds, None of these books agree with each other. We can't have that, right? 
And so you can see how all of this could happen, right? You have these minor, minor minorities, as Bradbury calls them. You have basically these special interest groups that have become so sensitive and the feckless people in charge, our leaders, have become so afraid of them for fear of, I guess, being thought heartless or cruel that it just starts to seem easier to not offend anyone and get rid of the books, right? If if Dr. Seuss offends these 10 people over here, look, we're the Dr. Seuss Foundation. We should just get rid of the books and stop printing them. And I know people are going to say, but Jordan, that wasn't the government banning those Dr. Seuss books. That was just a private foundation making a decision not to offend its readers. Isn't that noble and virtuous? But see, that's the point that Bradbury's making is that it doesn't start with the government. It starts with civil society. It starts with the people. The people first have to give up on the spirit of liberty and free expression. Then once they have, the government can make it official because, well, who will stand up for freedom of expression? Who will stop them? Does any of this sound familiar? Now, not to get too um, political on you because that is definitely not what this channel is about. But I'll just say that in the age of cancel culture, in the age of sort of frequent unpersonings, right, that we do, um, our cancel culture is so intense, right, that we can't even pick a Jeopardy host right now. So in the age of digital book burnings, right, social media mobs, even Amazon, right, Amazon right now controls over 80% of the book market, even they're banning the sale of certain books on their platform that they disagree with politically, right? They won't sell certain books because they have the wrong ideas in them. You see schools across this country no longer willing to teach Huck Finn or To Kill a Mockingbird because of the offensive words that they have in them. In fact, this book, Fahrenheit 4 Five, one has been banned from numerous schools. In some districts um, in the past, um, school districts have said, well, we're not going to ban the book outright, but we're going to censor. We're going to block out certain words on uh, the various different pages. And so I guess the administrators doing the banning, I guess the irony was lost on them, right? That you're when you hit the point where you're banning Fahrenheit 451, which is a book about banning books, you've really sort of lost the plot of America. And I think that's I think that's probably something people on uh, both sides of the aisle could agree with. Anyhow, so basically, this dystopian society arises from the fact that people just cannot handle the messiness of freedom. They can no longer tolerate disagreement, um, and they can no longer tolerate the fact that there is never going to be complete unity among humanity. And so the book banning really starts with the people, and the tyranny they experience really has the consent of the governed in a way, which is a really interesting thing that Bradbury does. Another theme that is done so well in this book um, is the idea that is primarily expressed by the bad guy Beatty, which is that thought can make life miserable. Thinking critically and knowing sort of how the sausage is made um, just leads to suffering and makes you sad. So the more you think, the more unhappy you're going to be. And of course, books make you think. And so we want to make people happy. Um, and so basically, um, so much of this book reminds me of that Socrates idea that the unexamined life is not worth living. It's this question, and you do see this in Plato's Allegory of the Cave. You see this, of course, in The Matrix by the Wachowskis. It's this question of, would you rather know the truth and be unhappy a lot of the time, or be happy and live a life of lies? Would you rather know the truth even if it hurts, even if it hurts really bad? Or would you rather be blissfully happy? Which is the most meaningful kind of life? In The Matrix, uh, right, Neo takes the red pill and decides that even though it's going to be brutally hard to live this life of rebellion and all of the comfort in his life is going to be gone, it's worth it to take the red pill and fight the good fight. Whereas Cypher, the bad guy character, the one who turns on his friends and turns on the cause, he decides to choose the hedonistic, empty pleasures because he just can't take the fight anymore and he's weak. Um, and so Cypher ultimately decides that even though the Matrix isn't real and he's living an artificial life, it's better than the truth in a way because the truth hurts so bad and there's so much suffering uh, where the truth resides. Do we have a deal, Mr. Reagan? You know... 
I know this steak doesn't exist. I know that when I put it in my mouth, the Matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy and delicious. After nine years, you know what I realize? <sighs> Ignorance is bliss. Then we have a deal. I don't want to remember nothing. Nothing. You understand? And I want to be rich. And so what one of the things I love about this book is that Montag chooses the truth. Montag chooses to take the red pill. He chooses to leave his life of comfort and materialistic pleasure um, to pursue the truth at any cost. And you know, it's only really when Montag meets Clarice, who is one of the few people who actually thinks for herself, that he realizes, he says, you know what? I'm not happy. I'm not happy with this artificial life. He realizes that something is deeply wrong and that he lives in a sick society. Just the way that people speed around and don't go outside or even think about their own lives, the violence and the war that's going on all the time, the jets that are constantly flying overhead, the blind mass consumerism, the decline of educational standards, the escapism, um, nothing connects. Montag repeats the fact that he feels like there's no bottom, there's no sides. He's just kind of floating rudderless in this sort of fluid, meaningless world that where nothing is solid and everything is always changing and there's nothing to grasp onto. And I love this part because this is actually what the philosopher Zygmunt Bauman calls liquid modernity. Liquid modernity is the sense that we're living through an age in which there is very little that is solid or foundational for human beings to grasp onto and that would give their life the feeling of solidity or meaning. When I ran my old show, The Western Canon Podcast, I actually had on a guest. Um, his name was, he's the philosopher Carl Truman, and he talked with me about this concept of liquid modernity, and so I thought I would show you a clip of that. He's very good at explaining the concept, so here you are. What is liquid modernity? Liquid modernity, I like the way you said it's a bit slippery because I want to say, yes, you clearly, in not <laughs> understanding it, you've completely understood it. It's, uh, when you think about identity, by and large, throughout history, human individual identity has been constructed in relation to fairly solid, permanent externalities. I give an example to the students. I grew up in a small town in the west of England. The local bank, the local bank, the building was made out of sandstone and it had giant Parthenon-like pillars out of the front. It's just a local branch of a bank. But that building's sending a message. It's sending a message to me. I was here long before you were born and I'll still be standing long after you've gone. I can think of that as a kind of point of identity, that institution, even now. We live in a world now where the, the typically static or, or, or institutions with longevity that exist, businesses, churches, families, even nations, these things that had a, a solidity that you could locate yourself relative to, these things are almost in a constant state of flux. My local bank, when I was living in Philadelphia, the local branch of the bank was built, uh, looked as if it was built out of cardboard to me. It was one of those sort of temporary buildings. And I would say to the students, you know, the message that's sending, you know, we arrived last Tuesday and we might be gone a week on Wednesday. There's no solidity there. So liquid modernity, when I use the term, is really referring to the fact that so many of the external markers that one might typically have used to ground one's identity are now things that are so ephemeral or so unstable that we cannot do that anymore. And this is why, and I say this to the students at Grove, you know, one of the interesting things about the modern age, America or Western Europe is, we have more money, more free time, better health care, no world wars to worry about. You know, we, we, have a, uh, you know, we have problems, but we have a comparatively prosperous uh, world that we now live in, and yet anxiety levels are at historic highs. Why is that? And I think it's a large part because 
the things that human beings usually cling to to give them their sense of identity. The, it's just like grasping at sand or grasping at running water now. We're free falling with little to hold us steady. When, when you were just explaining to that to me, I was thinking about growing up and realizing liquid modernity. Even when I was like 12 years old, watching baseball teams, uh, it used to be, my dad told me this, it used to be that baseball teams had the same players on that team and they would play for 20 years and then they would retire. And and they had a solidity. It wasn't this ship of Theseus sort of thing where it's a completely different team from year to year. What is it about the team that there is to cling on to such that you can say you're a Red Sox fan? And I started mm. to realize that and I said, I, I'm not that interested in baseball anymore because of this. <laughs> and why, how, why do I need that? Why do I need it to be all the same players? Why? And, I, and of course, I was 12 years old, so I, I didn't know the answer to that. But yeah, to quote Karl Marx, all that is solid melts into air. You 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 find this this uh, uh, yeah. I mean, he's anticipating liquid modernity in 1848 there as he looks at the industrial revolution. So, anyways, just the allegory, um, the commentary on our own society um, and where it's heading. This book still feels fresh in so many ways. And I'll just mention one more theme. Um, one of the main themes that runs throughout this story is courage. How difficult it is to have the courage um, to stand against the orthodoxies of your culture, even when this makes you unpopular, even when this makes you a pariah. Um, and how difficult it can be to feel like you're the lone dissenting personality in a sea of conformity and mindlessness and how important it is to have courage and stand up for what's right. So a couple of other things I liked, um, Fahrenheit 451 is in some ways really an ode, a love letter of sorts to the power of books, to the power of great literature and great minds and authors who write these amazing books, um, and certainly just to the power of the written word in general. So many authors, books, quotes are mentioned um, in Fahrenheit 451, and of course at the end you have the book people. Um, I won't spoil who these people are, but I'll just say that the concept is really cool and they represent, I think, in some ways, hope, right? The idea that there will always be hope or the possibility of rebirth um, uh, when you're fighting the long defeat, right? In the words of Papa Tolkien. It's this idea that civilization will always rebuild itself. Um, in in a way, the, the people of the book, or I think he calls them the book people um, at the end, they remind me of Harold Bloom's uh, what he calls the aesthetic underground, people who will keep a tradition alive even when that tradition is under threat, even when that tradition has to be um, hidden in the in the larder, to quote the poet Ahmad Shamlu, even when it has to be taken underground. All right, so what I didn't like, hmm, there is really nothing that I can think of. There really isn't much, to be honest, guys. I guess, if anything, I might have liked a bit more detail, a bit more world building and specificity. Although, on the other hand, that's probably one of the things that makes this book timeless, is that it really could happen anywhere. It's not overly specific. It could happen anywhere, anytime, to any people. Heck, it may be happening to us right now in our society as we retreat into our phones and lose ourselves in instant gratification and drugs and porn and fast food. And as our brains become rewired to need that constant dopamine hit that our social media apps provide as we spend more time plugged in and less time with the people around us and as we cower in fear of nature and of others. One thing I would have maybe liked more of, I guess I could say, is I would have kind of liked more time with Faber. Faber is an absolutely wonderful character. He's this like coward who becomes a hero. And I always like those kind of redemption arcs. Um, and I guess I would say maybe I even would have wanted a little bit more time with Clarice. But again, hey, maybe that's just good writing. That's Bradbury making me want more and leaving me thirsting to read the book again. Okay, so let's get finally to my ranking of this story. If you care to know, um, you might have already uh, figured out that it's going to be a very high uh, rating um, here. So for the story and the plot, very tight, uh, no words wasted, truly. Um, a few good twists, I won't spoil them for you. Nothing super fancy plot-wise, the plot gets a nine out of 10. The characters, the characters were awesome, vividly drawn. You really don't 
get to know anyone that well, um, except for Montag. And really, everyone else besides Montag ends up being fairly uh, enigmatic, but still beautifully drawn uh, characters. That gets a 9 out of 10. Um, the prose gets obviously a 10 out of 10. The prose is beautiful, so a knockout home run there. That was an easy call. For originality, I'm giving this a 10 out of 10. I know there are other dystopian stories that are similar to this one, um, but this story is so original. The prose at the very sentence level is original and beautiful. The way the story is told is highly original. The characters are fresh and instantly recognizable. They are each their own unique idiosyncratic person. The world building, totally expertly done, very concise. I just found myself wanting a little bit more is all. So the world building is going to get a 9 out of 10. And that puts us overall at a 9.4 out of 10. All right. So thank you for listening. Um, and let me know, I guess, in the comment section what I missed, what you thought I missed. Let me know what you think of Fahrenheit. Let me know which Bradbury book, right, or any other book at all that you would like to see me review on this channel in the future. And as always, thank you for tuning in to iWizard, and I will see you next time. Adios.